Hey guys, what is up? This is Anthony, it's me once again. It's that time of the year where I talk about my favorite movies of the year. There have been so many good ones to come out this year, and as always, I have some honorable mentions I want to give out. Um, I wrote down a list just in case I forget them um, in, what, in what order I put them in. Yeah, but anyways, uh, let's begin. Um, like I mentioned before, the honorable mentions, which are Creed 3, Evil Dead Rise, When Evil Lurks, Sisu, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, Barbie, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Megan, and Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. With all that being said, let's get to the films that did make the list. Starting off at number 15 is a comedy film that not only did I laugh out loud at, but also got very emotionally invested with, Joyride. Joyride is one of those raunch comedies that when you look at it, it just looks like some idiotic uh, film. But it actually has some deep meaning behind it, and honestly, it has quite a bit of heart to it. Like, this is the type of, you know, a friendship film that just goes all out with, with its humor, the amount of cusses that it has, but it also manages to be a very fun time. Having a very strong message, and characters I actually really liked seeing, I laughed, and I even got a little teary-eyed towards the end. At my number 14 spot is a biopic about shoes that was actually really, really, really entertaining. Air. Ben Affleck did a really strong job with direction, Matt Damon, everybody in the movie was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the way the story plays out is very investing, shockingly. Like, I was really engaged with the storyline of, you know, how exactly Air Jordans came to be. It's truly one of the more interesting biopics of the year, and it's a shame it bombed, because this is like the type of movie that a lot of people would have talked about more of this year, and I just found myself having a really fun time. I definitely recommend it. At my number 13 spot, I have Suzume, a very deep anime film from the director of one of the greatest anime films of all time, Your Name. This is another romance story that manages to succeed at almost every level, with its interesting characters, its unique story, its dazzling animation. It's not the only anime film to come out this year that was absolutely outstanding, as we'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, it's one of the best animated films of the year, and I'm glad the Golden Globes recognized it. It definitely deserves a nomination. Speaking of great animated films to come out this year, at my number 12 spot, I have Nimona, a very over-the-top, hilarious film that also manages to really tug at the heartstrings. Nimona is such a fun protagonist. Chloe Grace Moretz does an excellent job voicing her. The story of her helping out a man who is framed for murder just made for a really fun time. I really liked uh, their chemistry together, the main male lead and Nimona. It just, it plays out uh, very uh, complicated at first, but also manages to be very deep. Uh, I felt bad for Nimona, the way people treat her. It was just absolutely upsetting. And it's one of those types of movies where you shouldn't always judge someone for their appearance. It's one of Netflix's best animated films yet, and I highly recommend checking it out. At my number 11, we have my favorite horror film of the year, Talk To Me. This is one of the most inventive horror films to come out this year, and the fact it was made by two YouTubers, and the fact that their chemistry worked very well making this film is <laughs> absolutely outstanding to me. Talk To Me is one of those bizarre horror films that has such a unique concept behind it, and the directors really managed to pull off the storyline so well. It's not too long, it never feels boring, it always feels like it's doing something fresh and inventive. Talk To Me was just such a unique experience, and it's already greenlit for a sequel, and I'm interested to seeing how that plays out. Coming in at number 10 is uh, the first of a two-parter movie, though I have two of those on this list, but the first one I'm going to bring up is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. This movie often feels like it's not really much of a two-parter, but it's its own standalone film. That's how it felt towards the end of the movie for me, but Mission Impossible has everything that you could have possibly wanted from another fantastic installment in the Mission Impossible series. This franchise has come a long way, and we have yet to see another truly bad movie. I mean, none of, them, none of the movies were truly awful. I mean, I didn't like the second movie, but... It had its fair share of moments. There are some times where I felt like it could possibly go downhill, but but Dead Reckoning Part 1 truly proves that it's it still manages to succeed. And it uh, because of how good the movie was, it uh, made me not too impatient for when the next movie comes out. I don't think it's as good as Fallout in my opinion, but I do think it's a lot of fun and one of the most fun action films of the year. 
there were bound to be some movies that I should probably watch before doing my best of the year list, and one of those movies was Poor Things. Emma Stone is at one of her very best performances yet. Poor Things is a bizarre movie where we look at the revolution of a new woman, or a woman that was a woman but died and came back as a brand new woman, going through like she's growing as a child, even though she's a grown woman, but you know what, I shouldn't get into spoilers, but I can say that Poor Things is one of the most memorable times I, I'll probably have at the theater this year. It's, uh, it's visually stunning, it's engaging, it's truly bonkers, Everybody is phenomenal in the movie. Mark Ruffalo, Willem Dafoe, they just went all out here. And with its strong direction, this movie never felt boring in the slightest. Even though the movie's over two hours long, it felt like it went by pretty quickly. At number eight, I have the brand new holiday classic, The Holdovers. The Holdovers is one of those movies that I didn't know a whole lot about going in. But as I was watching this movie, I was all like, oh man, this movie is very deep. And I absolutely loved what they were going for with this film. Paul Giamatti is excellent. I love the relationship that he manages to have with this one kid in the movie, Angus. It made for a very, very deep time. It has some moments of frustration, but also has some moments of charm. Frustration as in characters getting frustrated in the movie. And it just had so much going for it. It never felt like it was going on way too long. The holdovers, I feel like, will be a Christmas classic in the near future. At my number 7 spot is a movie that was loved by many, but rarely ever got talked about. I barely heard anyone talk about this movie when it came out. In fact, it didn't do so well at the box office, but I honestly feel like it deserves more of a following after its release. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. This is based off a very popular novel, and it took them so long for them to get it released that I feel like it definitely paid off in the end. Abby Ryder Portson is terrific as uh, the lead role. It's a fantastic coming-of-age story that I feel like most young girls could actually relate to. It's a very engaging movie about, you know, uh, that feeling of when you're moving to a different place and you just don't know a whole lot about this new place that you're in. It's, it's a very deep film, and it's one that will pull at the heartstrings. It has a lot of charm to it, and it's from the director of Edge of Seventeen, which was phenomenal. In fact, I think this movie is even a little bit better than Edge of Seventeen. It's one of the most overlooked films of the year. I highly recommend it. Such an endearing film, and I loved every second of it. Coming in at number six is a film that would seem to be extremely cheesy, especially since it was from an old franchise with a lot of cheesy installments. But Godzilla Minus One absolutely lacked cheese and had everything else that you could have ever wanted in a Godzilla film. Ho-Ho knew what fans wanted to see. Not only were the monster battles epic, but the characters I actually really cared about. I did not expect to care about these characters at all. I expected it to be more focused on Godzilla and me just rooting for Godzilla, but while I did root for Godzilla, I rooted for the characters to survive in this movie. It has a really deep storyline and fun action that it just it just had it all. Like there are there are action movies out there that just tend to be fun and there are action movies out there that tend to just focus on characters. This movie manages to have both and manages to succeed at every single possible level. It's the Godzilla movie that Legendary Pictures wish they had in their library of films. And even with the new Godzilla and Kong movie, I definitely don't think it's going to live up to this masterpiece. At my number 5 spot, I think we can all agree what the best superhero movie of the year was. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is another epic Spider-Man film. With the amount of Spider-Man films that we've had throughout the years, Into the Spider-Verse is probably the one Spider-Man movie that we never thought would be a brand new classic. And now that a sequel is out, it just goes to show that this is a brand new franchise that I feel like we're all going to get hyped for. I mean, after this, I want to see the new movie, but... Because of how good it was, I, I'm i fine with waiting. This movie just had everything that made the first movie great and still has the same charm that the characters had. The amount of action while the movie at first seems like it's just there to throw a bunch of Easter eggs in your face. No, the Spider-Verse Spider movies manages to bring all these extra spider people in and they have a purpose. It manages to go deep with its story, and that's honestly what I feel like matters the most. It was a lot of fun, and I just cannot wait for that next movie. Hopefully, because of how good these two movies were, that it will definitely pay off in the end. 
And I honestly thought it was going to stay my favorite animated film of the year, but no, that has to go to my next pick. At my number four spot, we have the return of a master of not just animation, but filmmaking in general. Hayao Miyazaki is back with The Boy and the Heron, an absolute masterpiece of emotion and visual storytelling. Hayao Miyazaki really went all out here with crafting this story. I mean, I think, I think from what I've heard, it is based off of another story, but the way Miyazaki makes this story, he manages to have a lot into this movie. Like, there's a lot of little things to keep up with. Like, a lot of people are definitely going to be confused at first after leaving the movie. Like, a lot of people have mentioned how confused they were at first with the movie, but, you know, with multiple rewatches, I feel like the movie will just get better and will make more sense. I love movies like this. They manage to have you think. They manage to have you talking about them with other people. It manages to be the type of animated film that isn't just for eye candy. It has great talented voice acting performances from English voice actors. I really don't feel like it matters which version you're watching. Subtitle, dubbed, it doesn't matter. They're both great. Hayao Miyazaki is back. I truly missed him and he did not disappoint in the slightest with this film. At my number three spot is the most fun I've had with an action movie this year, John Wick Chapter 4. There have been so many great uh, franchise installments to come out this year, and John Wick Chapter 4 is, in my opinion, the best one. Not only that, the best in the series so far, and probably one of the best action movies I've seen in a really long time, because most people reference new action movies to John Wick. And with John Wick 4, it does have you thinking to yourself, this does feel the same, but further investment, it honestly doesn't feel all the same. There's new stuff that this movie adds to make it all the more intriguing and not just only focusing on the action, as it does focus on other characters that I honestly found to be very investing. I mean, sure, we all root for John Wick, but there are other characters in the movie that also manage to have a good amount of screen time that also make for good character investments. John Wick Chapter 4 manages to be a near three-hour action fest full of bullets flying everywhere and some really epic sequences that never managed to slow down. John Wick Chapter 4 is truly the must-see popcorn film of the year when it comes to action. I cannot believe how far this franchise has come, and I honestly don't mind if they don't make John Wick 5, because this, along with the other films, I feel like are just enough. All right, at my number two spot is another fantastic film from another legendary director, Killers of the Flower Moon. Martin Scorsese can really do no wrong here, and with this film, he manages to make this three and a half hour long epic feel like just two hours, just like with The Irishman. This is a movie that just has you thinking throughout, and it's not really a who done it, it's a who didn't do it. Like, there are times where you don't want uh, this person to have done what exactly they did with uh, the murder investment that's going on throughout this movie. I was just truly invested throughout this film and what exactly the movie had to offer in terms of its storyline. It has so much in terms of its strong performances, its great direction, and the environment that it has to show. It's truly another work of art from Scorsese. And it's crazy to think, at the age he's at, you would think he would lose his mojo, but he has it in the slightest. In fact, I feel like he's just starting to gain it back, even though he already had it, if that makes any sense. All right, and at my number one spot, I have Another great film from another legendary director. Some of the best directors of all time have made a lot of great movies this year and showing that exactly what I want to see in cinema. And Christopher Nolan has done that with Oppenheimer. A three hour long epic biopic with no action, no violence whatsoever. Just a three hour long heavy dialogue driven film about a man setting off a bomb. And who knew how investing it would be? As I was watching the film... I was never bored with the dialogue, and a lot of people have mentioned how it is a little bit hard to listen to the dialogue from Christopher Nolan's films a lot of the time, but that's what gives the movie so much rewatchability. Killian Murphy is phenomenal, Robert Downey Jr. is phenomenal in his supporting role, I am so happy he is actually doing good things this time after the Avengers uh, movies, after he retired as Iron Man, actually doing more good roles. Because I was worried Doolittle was going to destroy his career. But he proves that he is still a fantastic actor. All these fantastic actors managed to take their acting abilities and put them into this film showing exactly what they can do in IMAX on the big screen. It was one of the best IMAX experiences 
I have had this year. I, I mean, hell, it, it is my favorite IMAX experience of this year. With absolutely no CGI whatsoever, proving that big budget movies still can be fantastic even without the use of CGI. It just goes to show that there are people out there who do care, and Christopher Nolan cares about cinema. He cares about theatrical experiences. <laughs> he even cares about physical media. And honestly, I'm happy that the 4K of Oppenheimer has uh, been selling out really fast. I mean, I got my copy, and uh, yeah. Not only is Oppenheimer one of my favorite films of the year, I also think it's one of Christopher Nolan's best films ever. Maybe top three, I don't know. I definitely do know this, it is one of the best films to come out this decade. Some people might call it boring, I call it cinema. It's truly a work of art, and it's what I like seeing on the big screen. Oppenheimer is a masterpiece, and it's truly my pick for the best film of 2023. Well, guys, that is it. That is my list of the best movies of 2023. Let me know in the comments what your favorites were. Hopefully, we'll have some more great films to come out next year. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Word out.